Welcome back. I hope you've had a chance for a quick break or a tea or coffee. We're going into our penultimate session now. Um, so I'm not going to waste any time at all. I'm just simply going to say thank you to Mamadou for joining us and hand over to Dare, who's going to take us through the session. So Dare, over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, let's start without um, uh, uh, further ado. Um, first, I would like to introduce um, uh, Mamadou Dayan Baldi. He is um, our deputy director in, in UNHCR for the Division of Resilience and the Solutions. In his capacity, he oversees the UNHCR's global programs uh, on education, livelihood, and the economic inclusion, and the social protection, food security, and the durable solutions. Before um, he took over his positions, Mamadou worked with UNHCR for more than 22 years um, in different field positions in Africa, in Benin, Chad, Ethiopia, Liberia, etc., and in, in South in the in Asian part, South uh, South Asia, South Korea, as an example, and uh, uh, he has a PhD in international law. Uh, he taught international law and human rights in civil universities as well. Uh, we also will have our uh, colleague uh, uh, Anjanesh uh, Mahatma. She's our senior dual solutions coordinator. First, Mamadou likes to have the cameras open. He's not very virtual in this sense. So uh, please keep the cameras open. And he also has his second jab of COVID vaccine soon. So my, he might be running, but he will still be listening to us and trying to answer the questions. So Mamadou, if you don't mind, I just want to ask you some questions for the, for the colleagues here. Uh, before we go to Iraq colleagues as well, we will have the second part of it. But in general, in my work in the field and by different actors who don't know CCCM very well, we are sometimes sort of uh, seen as we only think about the camps. We, we want people to come to camps. We want to build uh, shelters to them and we want them to stay there. We don't have ideas you know, about before, during and after, which is not the case. We always try to avoid people coming to the camps. When they come to the camps, we try to have more longer term solutions, working with different actors to do, uh, to do that. So they are the last results and they save lives. Sometimes longer than expected, they exist. We know in many countries, but we strive to find uh, longer term solutions. So in, in your opinion, uh, Mamadou, to us and to the colleagues, what do you think are the main considerations that we should look after in the IDP sites? How, how we can really ensure durable solutions are, are looked after when, when we work on the IDP sites? No, thank you, Dare. Thank you, colleagues. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Um, you know, first of all, and uh, I was really uh, very clear that uh, if you guys have had um, as good discussions as the music was, um, then you definitely don't need me. You have got your solutions to all your problems. So you should just walk to get my job and get sick. That's, uh, that's what's going to happen. But more seriously, um, uh, for me, it's a pleasure to join you um, to have these conversations. I was recently with Dare uh, on mission to Mozambique and, uh, and um, CCCM has always uh, been, I think, something of interest to me uh, because also I happen to be part of that generation that started working on displacement before the establishment of the clusters, you know, pre-2005-06 when we were all trying to struggle to, 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 to see how to respond to people who are displaced within their own countries and uh, how to find a solution so they remain nationals in their own countries so uh perhaps there just to 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 start with a shorter answer to your questions i think um what we need to really uh, um, emphasize is that camps and settlements uh, are to be just last resort it should just be last resort it should not be the default position. Whether you're working with internally displaced persons or refugees, um, camps and other things tend to isolate, tend to 
to uh, to keep people to to exclude them and uh, all our efforts when we are trying to protect when we are trying to support we're looking at the guiding principles you know francis deng and all the work that has been done later the kampala convention it's about really helping people live normal lives so they happen to be displaced today. We, all our efforts should be about not isolating them. It's about helping them being part of the communities that host them. So camps and settlements should be only last resort and should not be the default position. Um, about 10, 11 years ago, I was the head of our solutions unit in, uh, in, in Geneva uh, before going back to the field. We started a, a, um, you know, a, a, a policy that uh, later became the alternative to camp policy. But the first title we used was no camps at all. So I think when it comes to solutions, this is that. It's about trying to, to avoid as much as possible. That would be the way for, for us. So, um, so when they are established uh, as a last resort, as a necessity, we should look for the medium to long term looking at the inclusion, looking at the government's plans, looking at how, um, you know, by the time they are left or by the time we leave, they will be part of the communities that host them. These are really made for practical reasons. So despite we trying our best to make sure that there are no comes, while we are looking for alternatives, we know that there are necessary at times. And when there are necessary, let's definitely work on linking them to what already exists so that there will be a sense of normalcy, that there will be a sense of belonging uh, when people leave. And for that to happen, I think there are a few ingredients. First of all, is to understand the government as well as the plants by the communities. And uh, um, understanding that is not necessarily an issue from capital cities. It's an issue in urban settings. It's an issue of working better with urban uh, uh, urban authorities and the mayors and the, the local communities. And understanding that requires, um, you know, working much more closely and understanding what the people themselves feel and how they are looking at themselves and how they are looking at the future. And um, also this is uh, quite context specific and the context specific means that part of Iraq will be differently looked at, part of Ethiopia will be differently looked at as it was dif differently looked at when we were responding to the, uh, to, the, to the crisis in the Balkans. Uh, I happen to be involved in some of them, you know, um, um, internal displacement that no longer exists today. It's about looking at dif this, this different context. Um, as for UNHCR, our first engagement was as part of the first Addis Ababa peace agreement uh, post-1972 um, in, in, in the Sudan. What happened really was in relation and linking what we are doing with the plans of the authorities and at that national level. And um, I, I just want to start uh, or, or try, uh, uh, stop by uh, um, um, just saying that we should not be complacent you know, uh, we tend to see the settlement, we tend to see the status quo. And uh, I don't think that that should be the right approach. We should not be complacent. We need to constantly look for opportunities to avoid the settings that we are putting in place. Um, IDPs uh, live lives, they get married, they start families, they need change, the protection capabilities change. Some of them get more vulnerable or just get more capable. How can we adapt to that? So that flexibility is also a necessity. So for me, these are some of the ingredients I wanted to share with you at this stage. I'm sure there will be follow up, follow up uh, questions, but few things. One, <clears throat> only last resort. But we know that sometimes they are necessary, but when they are necessary, let's make sure that we are trying our best to avoid them and to look for alternative on a constant basis. And given the displacement, the length of displacement that is happening now, we used to say five years is too much, 10 years is too much. Now we are talking about 16, 17, 18 years. How can we make sure that we also work much more closely with the national authorities at the subnational level?
And finally, making sure that the voices of the concerned persons are the one guiding us. That is not something coming out of Geneva or something coming out of a capital city, but that adaptation and that understanding of their needs and their capabilities. We did um, a, uh, for some of you who are aware, and Anshinesh will put in the, in the chat box a, a reflection that we called um, uh, you know, our, our additional submission to the high level panel on solutions. We did some reflections about how UNHCR has looked at solutions in the past and uh, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And, um, and, and, and finally, uh, also just saying that, um, you know, by putting people in camps, preventing them from contributing, not constantly looking for solutions, we are just wasting people's human capital and that should not happen. So I stop there, there, and then um, recognizing that you might have some follow-up questions before I, I leave you with your great music, as well as uh, some of the colleagues that I recognize here on the call with whom I have worked in the past in a few contexts. There, over to you. Mamadou, thank you for, uh, for this uh, brief answer for a very complicated question. I think, I think the dilemma is there, as you said, you know, we try to avoid as much as we avoid the humanitarian crisis and the wars and, the, and, the, and the, all the sufferings of the human beings, but it's happening. I had my second question, which you answered part of it. I think you said that we have to work with the local authorities. My question is, are there other actors that we have to work with? You mentioned with the affected populations and how should we as a CCCM actors in these camps, in these IDP setups, how should we work? How should we engage with those actors? I think two things really. Um, um, I've spoken about the authorities or the communities, or whether formal or informal authorities, because it goes beyond the, you know, for a lawyer like me speaking about the, the, the non formal authorities might be seen as something, um, you know, like a, an anachronism. But this is what we need to understand that there will be informal authorities and sometimes much more effective than the formal authorities themselves. So I would say, first of all, the real authorities, the authorities on the ground, we need to work with them. The second one are the populations, are there, and as well as the representatives, whether those who are being displaced or the others who are hosting them, that's, uh, that's two. And the third one is more and more the development actors. Um, we've been working on developing uh, specific ways of working with development actors. Uh, it might be sometimes difficult, but more and more government recognize that while they are looking at security issues, they also need to look at humanitarian issues and they need also need to look at development issues because development and lack of development is often one of the root causes of these problems. So even though they are slow, and very slow, very often, we need to engage them. And how do we engage with them? It's about having the data. And sometimes it's not as sophisticated as some people might want to, 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 to show or to portray and to mystify. I think it's about having the right information and aggregating it and, and, and sharing it as as long as it is linked with the realities on the ground. And, and, and two, making sure that, uh, um, you know, we, we, we keep updating. And um, I think the, the, the strength of the members of clusters, I'm not talking about the cluster itself, but members of the cluster is very often the agility, that possibility to really adapt. As for the cluster itself as a machinery, and I work for a bureaucracy, UNHCR myself, so I know how difficult it is to move us, right? As an institution, as a cluster, and all of that. We just need to constantly remind ourselves that the clusters were established as a way of helping that greater um, um, that, 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 that greater work to, towards some very specific objective like our institutions. <clears throat> so we should not be losing that focus, right? That's just a cluster as well as our institutions are just a means to the an end, right? The end is to help people live much more dignified lives. So if you ask me, how can the clusters work? I think in some context, it could be individual members of the cluster. In some other context, it will be clusters, members are joining efforts uh, towards that, that greater objective, but uh, also knowing that government do not react the same way as development actors. Some of them are very risk averse, 
like development actors as compared to, to, to many of us. These are all part of the learning. So um, I would say to you again, context specific, um, let's look at them, but um, there is a potential grow in, in the area of engaging with development actors as well as the local communities. They bring in capabilities that, uh, uh, that we often, uh, how should I say, whether willingly or unwillingly, we do not use sufficiently well. Um, you know, we some of us were involved in the World Humanitarian Summit and uh, all the discussions that happened there about localizations and, and all of that. But I think it should be also common sense to understand that in many of these settings, there are capabilities. There are capabilities on the part of the host. How can we make sure that our efforts are not to disempower them and later can come and say, you know, let's us empower you uh, after we have disempowered them. So I think these are all very uh, things that many of you know. I know some of the individuals on this call. I'm not saying to you anything that is new, but uh, but yes, I think bringing them together will be quite critical. And as I said again, Anshina should remain on the call. She will be, um, um, you know, joining you. I myself will be uh, will be listening to some of the conversations. If uh, the second dose does knock me down, I will try to, to join you back later. But otherwise, I think you are in safe hands. And uh, I'm really thanking you for, for hosting me, one, and two, for the great music, and three, for seeing some of you on the call. And uh, wishing you all the best for the remaining part. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Mamadou, thank you very much. Good luck with the vaccine. And hopefully, you will not be knocked down. Uh, at least next time when we travel together, you will be vaccinated, not only me. It will still be a risk for you, but bye-bye, friends. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, safe travel. So I think um, here, I mean, I see also one put, put um, a very, very important question because, uh, yes, uh, we are perceived or um, some actors sometimes think that CCCM and institutions are two different things. And sometimes also we find ourselves in a situation that here yeah, we are talking a lot about how to maintain the dignity in the camps, which is of course our main accountability. We should not put any undignified conditions in the camp because they are not the solutions, but, but more to really find the best possible ways to, to maintain the, the dignity. Now, with this, I would like to first thank the colleagues from Iraq who managed to join us on Friday. I know that there are many things to do in Baghdad, especially in this weather time. I'm sure that the weather is fantastic there. So I'm sure that you would have really loved to be outside in Rashid Street across the river, but you still made it to join us. So we very much appreciate uh, Kate Holland, our uh, uh, CCCM cluster coordinator there, and also Valentina, Baki, she is um, uh, uh, the Returns and the Recovery Unit head in, in Iraq. So in Iraq, there has been different discussions and everything has a wall and the opposite. And uh, sometimes we say that the opposite of coordination is actually over coordination. The opposite of love is not hatred. It's different thing. And uh, in, in this country, there has been different way of, of using durable solutions for the camps. There has been many, many questions about the, the situation, whether it is actually exposing people to further risks or providing any solution or is politicized, et cetera, et cetera. But also there's the other angle of the cluster that's being really confronted with, uh, uh, with the durable solution, with identifying the best practices, with giving better arguments, et cetera, et cetera. So with that and with the colleagues uh, uh, listening here, I would like to give you to the floor. I understood that you got a, a presentation. Alistair, don't kill me. I know you hate surprises, but I hope that this was done in coordination with you. Uh, so um, over to you, colleagues. Thanks very much. Um, just to check that you can both hear me and see the presentation. My connection has been suffering also from the heat, I think. Um, if there's a problem, please do shout. Uh, thank you very much to, to Dare. Um, 
So Valentina and I wanted to speak a little bit today about the experience in Iraq with durable solutions and as it relates to CCCM. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about sort of the overall situation with camps and informal sites here um, and how that relates to the durable solutions discussion um, sort of in the past and currently um, and then also the engagement and opportunities um, of CCCM with durable solutions both in the past um, sort of the past and current role of um, CCCM as a sector, as well as individual CCCM actors, um, and also reflect a little bit on the new durable solutions set up in Iraq, um, and how, as, as a sector, we've been engaging with that. Um, Valentina is going to speak a little bit about um, possibly the more interesting programmatic side um, and an ongoing facilitated returns program um, over the last couple of years in Iraq and the intersection of that with CCCM. So to start off um, a little bit of context, um, I thought it might be useful to know what we're talking about. Um, and I know there are several other current and um, past Iraq colleagues in the call um, who um, I'm sure will be happy to jump in. Um, so in Iraq, the, the conflict started seven years ago. I mean, you can see in the top graph here, the green are the number of returnees and the blue is the number of IDPs, thanks to our friends at DTM for this graph. Um, currently um, classifying by those two population groups, there's 4.9 million returnees and 1.2 million IDPs. Um, of those, um, 184,000 is the current population um, in 27 camps um, and just over 108,000, give or take quite a few people possibly um, in just over 500 informal sites. Um, and here we count quite a range um, of people in informal sites between five households up to over 500 in the largest one. Um, one significant feature of the camp uh, response here has been a series of camp closures over the last three years, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, you can see here the bottom graph, which tracks population in the formal camps over time um, mid 2018 till now, so over the last three years, and you can see the significant drops there um, are among the forced closures. In the six months, so so far until 2021 till now, departures have pretty much plateaued, um, and so we're at a, a fairly static population, although people still are leaving by themselves. Um, for those of you who have ever been involved in Iraq, on the right is a map of where the formal camps are now, um, which is predominantly in the Kurdistan region. Um, with two remaining camps in federal Iraq. So quite a, a changing sort of environment there. Looking a little bit about camps, CCCM and, and returns. Um, so, so where we are now in Iraq is really a conversation on sort of durable solutions with a capital D and a capital S. Um, but there's been a huge amount of work that's happened over the last, particularly over the last five years um, on, on returns. There were a maximum at one point of around 160 camps and sub camps. Um, there's now 27 of those remaining. The majority of families have left through self-organized returns, um, although some from forced closure as well. Um, and throughout that period of time, there's been obviously a huge effort, predominantly of humanitarian actors, but a, um, also a huge amount of development funding as well that's gone into Iraq to support those families as they returned. Um, two notable things from the CCCM side has been a, a big CWC effort um, and then one callback to a session earlier in the week which is community resource centres and that's CCCM out of camp, the area based approach um, that we were hearing about from Giovanna um, that had CCCM actors working in return areas and um, predominantly with returnees and their communities um, and really supporting through the CCCM activities in urban spaces putting a hold on that though. Um, and then bringing it back to camps and informal sites, we've had a lot to do in terms of information flow and intentions information. Um, for anyone who is interested, um, there is a lot of technical guidance from Iraq on camp consolidation and camp closure as we've brought those maximum 160 sites and subsites down to the 27. Um, the majority through planned processes of people as people have left um, and then as well, the forced camp closures um, that have happened at various points. We had 16 camps and informal sites closed at the end of last year, um, and a lot of operational guidance on the response to that. So sort of even before in Iraq, we really started talking about durable solutions as a standalone topic. There was a huge amount done and, and CCCM really was a, a, a sort of a very central part of this. Um, 
particularly through information flow. Um, I was looking back through the camp management toolkit just before this um, and the responsibilities of camp management um, as relates to durable solutions and that really emphasizes what Juan was mentioning um, as well. Uh, and I think we heard about just now in terms of the engagement with the communities. One thing that we've repeated um, over quite a number of years are intention surveys and that is being refined over and over again um, to try and draw out from the communities um, movement intentions, that's camps and informal sites used for the planning in camps and return areas, which is all very nice. You can see here some very shiny products. Um, where we're at at the moment is um, a question mark essentially, especially for the camps on how to move forward. The little circular graph pie chart on the left looks at movement intentions in the next 12 months. This is a recent survey that was done by REACH and 1% of people are intending to return in the next 12 months. More interestingly, 21% of people say they don't think they're ever going to return and that goes up to 60% in some of the camps. Now the conversation in Iraq is really focused and has always been very, very focused on the idea of return. Um, and we're starting to sort of come up against what, what should be done or, or what could be done to support families um, who, who don't want to return. Um, there's particularly, you know, we hear a lot about um, obstacles for returning. People's shelters are destroyed, there's lack of livelihoods opportunity, but around a third of people are talking about sort of fear or trauma associated with their area of origin. Um, recognizing a bit of a limitation, and we're gonna come back to reflect on this a bit more later around community engagement. Um, and as we move toward a more deliberate um, approach to durable solutions, what more can we be doing in terms of community engagement um, and moving toward ideally a community led process this is something that we don't have answers for and we'd be very happy to hear about any ideas or suggestions. Taking it up a level to talk about durable solutions as a whole, um, and this calls back a little bit to the high level panel um, that was mentioned earlier. So in the past, the focus has been very much on returns. There were governor returns committees set up in the, the governorates between uh, local authorities um, and international actors around camp closures, around supporting people to return. Um, there's been a returns working group for a long time, which as CCCM, there was a strong connection to, not least because there were two co-chairs who are ex-CCCMers who are both also in this call, um, who were co-chairing the returns working group. Um, and that had a huge role in Iraq in terms of particularly research and information flow around, around, around returns and informing the response. What we have at the moment is a new coordination architecture um, of phrase to strike fear into anyone who's not a cluster coordinator, or perhaps to strike fear into anyone who is a cluster coordinator. Um, the little diagram on the right, which I made deliberately small so you didn't get bogged down in looking at things, is our new coordination architecture for durable solutions that sits alongside the humanitarian coordination architecture. Um, it sits under the RCHC, it has an HCT sort of semi-equivalent, um, which is led by IOM and UNDP, it has a technical working group, sort of intercluster equivalent, not really, um, which is IOM, UNDP and NRC. Um, and then it has area-based coordination mechanisms. They recently launched a new strategy and operational framework. Um, and that looks at three priority groups, around 200,000 IDPs in camps, 130,000 in critical shelter. So this is including families and informal sites and nearly 900,000 people, so nearly a million returnees. And the, uh, this is sort of being implemented and being taken forward by these area-based coordination mechanisms. Excuse the very dry slide, this becomes a lot more relevant later when we start talking more about the CCCM engagement in this. Again, a little dry. Um, the strategy for durable solutions in Iraq uh, 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 just to add, within that technical working group, there's two clusters that are represented. Here at the moment, it's protection and shelter. Um, and otherwise, there are, it's a mixture of development actors, um, UN agencies, NGOs. Um, strategically, looking at principles of government leadership, housing and HLP, livelihoods, basic services, documentation, social cohesion, safety and security, as you would expect. 
notably they focus on return areas and they focus on um, locations for people to sort of reintegrate and resettle um, as well as facilitated movements. Um, I am going to hand over now to Valentina to talk a little bit more programmatically about facilitated movements in Iraq, um, the program that IOM has been running um, and the work with particularly camp management that's been done on that. Um, and then I'm going to come back to reflect a little bit more on this sort of setup in Iraq and the engagement of CCCM strategically and then operationally um, within this durable solutions conversation. Valentina, over to you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, everyone. Um, so following, a, as you saw in the previous uh, slides, uh, towards 2017, 18, um, the numbers of people returning uh, started slowing down um, and we started seeing uh, less and less um, spontaneous uh, departures from, from camps and from areas of displacement. And also, as Kate mentioned, um, the pressure on closing camps uh, even uh, forcefully uh, really increased. Um, so around in 2019, IOM, but in collaboration with a number of other organizations, came together um, in looking at how it could be possible to support uh, people who were still in displacement and who probably, as, as also the REACH slides show, um, are people who at that point were less able to, to depart camps, particularly if that it was uh, in order to return. Um, so the, this group of organizations led by IOM started looking at how better support um, families that were still in displacement and try to identify an alternative, offer an alternative mechanism than um, forced closure and, uh, and evictions of people who then often ended up in secondary displacement or ended up returning, but in, in really challenging conditions. So in 2019, this uh, effort started. Um, in, it, it was in 2019, but then in 2020, there was also more um, engagement with these activities. In, uh, in the summer, um, there were first few pilots uh, from, from some of the camps. Um, and then over the last year, there has been uh, more regular uh, work in uh, facilitating departures, primarily from uh, three camps, um, and, but also uh, some smaller departures from, uh, from non-camp settings. So this is to say this type of intervention is not, not necessarily uh, exclusively tied to camps, but camps were prioritized in consideration of the fact that they were the most at risk of um, the, where the population was more at risk of eviction. So as you saw, there was a strategic objective within the durable solution operational framework that was developed by the durable solution technical working group. Um, but then when we look at specifically the program that we are running, um, but also in collaboration with and support from, from other organization, what the program seeks to do is to support displaced population in, in addressing the situation that has now become a protracted displacement as this, most of the people still in camps have been displaced for over three years. Um, and to do so um, voluntarily, uh, I can explain more the details of it, uh, but also in a safe and dignified manner. Um, the approach seeks to understand better what are the obstacles of the families that are still in the camps through, through individual profiling uh, and to then identify uh, ways to respond to the different specific barriers that, uh, that families are addressing, uh, are facing. Um, and in order to do this, um, this is very much uh, an effort that needs to be done with other organizations and needs to be um, looking at multi-sectoral responses across, across the board and across the process, so from before departure until, um, until after departure and, and arrival in the place where people decide to, to settle. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this graph um, is, uh, is available on the, in the Global Solution Technical Working Group Strategic Framework, but it comes from a study that was done by IOM, um, and it looks at trying to better understand the, the, and, and depict the barriers to return. I mean, they're probably not extraordinary and they're common to many contexts, um, but as you see for the IDPs that are still uh, in displacement, um, housing, as Kate mentioned, is, is one of the big barriers. 
as, as a high level, there are really high level of destructions in a lot of the areas of origin. Um, and there are also challenges related to HMP and related to the compensation schemes that um, are not always easy to access um, and, and to receive the compensation. Um, livelihoods uh, remain an issue, especially with areas that have been have seen large waves of displacements and, and where a lot of businesses have been uh, uh, have been destroyed. Basic services as well. Um, there is a specific issue around social cohesion, as a lot of the families that um, remain in displacement, or, or a proportion of the families that remain in displacement, um, are perceived to have taken a specific part in the conflict, and therefore um, are often not necessarily allowed back um, into the um, into the communities uh, that easily, and that requires additional support. Uh, but also there are um, other types of dynamics um, that are not necessarily um, specific to that part of the conflict, but still um, in terms of tribal tensions and, and other political dynamics that are uh, blocking, in some cases, returns to certain area. Um, and then the last point is um, what is also usually one of the most important points in uh, um, in supporting uh, returns or relocation or access to solution is, is safety and security, particularly when displacement is resulting from a conflict. And, uh, and while certain parts uh, of Iraq are safe, they can still be perceived as unsafe by some members of the population, um, either because of the type of configuration of security forces, but also for the dynamics that are still present. And in addition, some areas are still definitely unsafe. Um, there's also a number of potentially exacerbating factors, but I will not go into that. Next slide. So this is a very simple um, illustration of uh, what uh, the program looks like in terms of phases. Um, it is, um, as I said, it started off particularly in camps, but uh, we have used it also in, uh, in other settlements, in, um, um, urban settlements especially. Um, the, if the program starts with a sort of pre-departure component, which looks both at the area of displacement and at the population in displacement and at the area of origin or area of location. So, and just to clarify, uh, it started off as a facilitated voluntary return uh, program whereby return was the main um, sort of solution that was uh, supported um, in light particularly of the, the reality of, uh, of the preference um, that was available at the time. But more recently, we have actually been able to create space for people to choose to go somewhere else. Um, and through a process of, um, of dialogue with authorities, we have been able to support also the relocation of, uh, of some families to other locations where they decided to go. Um, it's very much context dependent. In, in some governorates, it has been possible. In others, there is still a lot of resistance. Um, but we, we have been exploring the possibility of, of giving those other options to people in reflection of the, the diagram that, um, that Kate showed where intentions to return are really, um, in some cases, uh, minimal. Um, so the program starts with uh, with activities in the camp uh, or in the area where population are displaced. Um, they are explained about the program uh, specifically of the different steps of it. They are explained how they can sign up for the program if they are interested. They are also explained about the total voluntary nature of the participation, whereby people can drop out at any point uh, in the program, effectively. Um, and they're also asked um, a number of questions around whether they have been visiting their area of origin or the area where they want to move to uh, recently, if they have information about the area, um, and they're explained how we can provide otherwise this type of knowledge. We, we work closely with local authorities to come to camps. In some situations, we had also organized go-and-see visits to areas of origin. Um, we then, at the same time and in parallel, initiate um, a process in the areas of, uh, of destination of these families. Um, so we work with local authorities to understand and confirm the, um, the possibility of, of uh, supporting people to return to those communities. Uh, but there's also dialogue around the type of issues that are present in the area. Uh, in the case of IOM specifically, there are a number of communities where we already carry out recovery work. and so. 
to make sure that this is part of the ongoing dialogue and planning uh, with the authorities for the program. In other areas, this is done through the area based or hopefully will be done through the area based coordination groups that um, Kate mentioned. Um, and in other areas, other partners um, are also present. But there is definitely an intention, especially at, at least at the design phase of this program, to link up as much as possible with, with the area of uh, destination in recognition that um, there needs to be both acceptance, but also there needs to be capacity of, uh, of receiving these families and of these families uh, reintegrating in those areas. Um, so these two steps are sort of preparatory, um, and then we take uh, families through a number of steps. They're also a bit context specific, and also they depend on um, on the type of barriers families are facing, whether they're primarily related to shelter and, and livelihoods in area of origin, or if there is a component of uh, community tension or, or barriers that, from the communities to receive people back. Um, but then we um, carry out a number of other activities where people are informed about um, the conditions in their of origin, about the, what will happen once they leave, um, either through um, having local authorities come to the camp or also through providing um, overview of services wherever um, there is presence and, and we have the capacity to provide that mapping. Um, we then provide grants uh, to support the departure. Um, we find that often the people who, again, are left in the camp are, are struggling at times to uh, find sufficient resources, particularly for uh, destinations that are far away. So they're provided with um, uh, grants and then they organize their own transportation. In the past, we did in kind, but um, we found that this method works a lot better, both in, in terms of COVID considerations, but also it gives families more agency on how they want to organize their departure, when they want to travel. And it also allows for effectively a smoother passage at a lot of the checkpoints. Um, we then follow up with families upon arrival um, through on the same day to confirm their arrival, and then through a number of other monitoring exercises over time. Uh, we then continue to remain in contact with them because we provide additional grants for the first three months after people have left to support, especially um, we, what we found through, through PDMs is that this money is particularly used to um, pay for accommodation, um, either rental or for initial rehabilitation of, uh, of homes, but also for some basic needs that um, are still present outside the camp. Um, after that, there is a strong focus on, on what happens after and so on, linking these families to services, either through programs that um, IOM carries out in the communities, so we have systems of automatic referrals, to livelihood activities, to shelter rehabilitation, um, or to other organizations. Um, and so that's uh, sort of the key part to really enable then the support to reintegration and, and we follow through monitoring. Um, so that's a brief description. Over to Kate. Thank you so much. Um, and just finally, sorry, um, just to then bring it back to um, a bit of a sort of a higher level look at CCM and durable solutions. So in addition to the interaction that we, of course, have both at strategic level and with camp management at camp level um, in the facilitated returns programming, um, I seem to have just lost my screen, sorry. Can everyone see it still? Yes, we Someone can see it. Can All right, um, sorry. So <coughs> a few reflections just very quickly on CCM and durable solutions and sort of moving forward in that in Iraq. So as Valentina mentioned and I mentioned earlier, um, we have now this durable solutions mechanism and new architecture that is centered on an area-based planning. The area-based coordination mechanisms are a small number of agencies that have been tasked to create plans of action um, that cover these specific areas. And they cover some areas of high numbers of return. They don't cover displacement areas, um, which means that from a SCCM perspective, it, it's something that I've been finding it difficult to wrap my head around. And the conversations about durable solutions don't start in the camp. They, they're starting in areas of origin with the exception of the, the part of facilitated returns. Um, and so I think finding space for that conversation about how to support people in camps if they aren't in areas under this area-based planning mechanism is going to be challenging moving forward. 
Similarly is true of the informal families living in informal sites and sort of as CCCM, we focus on families living in informal sites because we assume things about them, including a higher vulnerability. Some of the informal sites fall into the areas where these plans of action are being made, um, but in such small numbers that already I think we are starting to see them sort of fall through the cracks. And they, there's a question there that, that I hope can start to be discussed more in how do you ensure appropriate support to relatively small numbers of families, but families who are particularly vulnerable. Um, taking an example in Iraq, there are families in informal sites here who were displaced in 2003 and displaced and lived in an informal site and were displaced from that site in 2014 and have moved back again. Um, and so I think as we, as we start to move into the final years or the final part of the humanitarian response, it's certainly a concern of these particularly vulnerable families and how to center them in a longer term, in longer term planning or how to support them. We also have a disconnect between the expectations of the government and the wishes of the families. Um, the government very much focuses on return and very much focuses on camp closure, seeing the camp as sort of a symbol of humanitarian crisis in Iraq. And you can see that with the, the forced closures that we've had over the last few years. Many of the family IDP families, on the other hand, say they want to stay and integrate. As camp management actors and as CCCM actors, we obviously want to engage more with the communities. We want to ideally have some kind of community-led process with them over longer term planning, but that is only possible if the political will is there to support the families to achieve whatever solution they want to. Um, and still now it's very much focused on people, people's return. Um, there's also a difficulty in the international community as we sort of shift the conversation toward uh, longer term planning and sort of planning and communicating with community in parallel to the government um, rather than sort of in step with the government. Um, and then the role of CCCM in transition and Juan mentioned this at the very start of the, the session. Um, in the past and when we had the, the mass returns from camps um, and the previous sort of setups, CCCM was very integral to that. As the response has reduced, um, 200,000 people in camps, 100, 150,000 people in informal sites is, is small in Iraq compared to the big response, but of the communities who are particularly vulnerable. Um, in informal sites, um, we see, and our, the CCCM actors here see, the sort of real significant role that could be played in transition for that, which is not necessarily recognized in the rest of the response. And so there's a question mark there as to, I guess, how we pitch ourselves and how we are seen um, as, as, part of, as part of that transition. And also in camps, um, it was mentioned earlier as well um, about the connection of camp management to communities and how important that is when working towards solutions. As we see sort of more and more of the durable solutions discussion here take on a life of its own, it's sort of more disconnected from humanitarian actors. Um, and again, sort of this durable solutions seen as starting in return areas rather than starting at the camp end, kind of disconnected from not only camp management, but our colleagues in protection as well, for example, who, who are so connected to, to the community. Um, and not seen as a core actor in moving toward durable solutions. Um, and something that I wanted to reflect on in Iraq, the most mentioned as a high level planning, there's sort of an increased separation in this conception of durable solutions with a capital D and a capital S um, as a discipline in itself, rather than as the nexus between humanitarian development and peace building. Um, certainly in the humanitarian side, um, there is a conversation the conversation is durable solutions standalone rather than durable solutions as a shared goal, which makes it difficult as CCCM as a sector, as a cluster, but then also as CCCM actors to find the spaces in that that we really see the, the value for ourselves. Um, I can't see what's in the chat, so I'm going to stop sharing the presentation um, and hope that there are some interesting questions. Um, Kate and Valentina. Thank you. I think this was um, a very useful discussion and it's, it's more uh, probably a uh, food for thought for CCCM in the future, because I, I see that we have our champions here. I mean, Bjorn, Jen, uh, of course, Juan has been, has been providing some comments, um, of which some say that there is a need for us to go through uh, some internal advocacy in our agencies. 
um, to tell that camps, you know, we are not in a sim because we are in a camp. Actually, we are just doing the, the ultimate save of life in the bottom of the crisis because this is the last resort. People don't go through anything. It is, it is not a sin for us. But also in the meantime, Jen was mentioning some good practices in some countries where probably there ha there's, there's something that we could probably learn because I think that there's a local organizations there, there's an ownership from the, from the actors. Um, and and the, in general, as, as Juan was telling that, we are also sometimes, we have been feeling constantly that whenever durable solutions are discussed, TCM actors are told, you know, please stay outside, these are durable solutions, these are not camp discussions. But now from, from you, I think it's also the good things that we have, you know, we have Valentina, we have you working together with the knowledge of how to involve Valentina referred to camps. Um, uh, Valentina referred to HLP. I mean, Jim is with us here, by the way. It's not only the house aspect. I was reading about Iraq where there's this big statement in Ambar that people cannot even use their agricultural land or even they will not allow others to use their agricultural land and send money to them because then, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know all, these, all these stories. So Iraq and probably through some other countries, we have some, some good experiences for all of us to learn and, the, and the, to, to hear from, from each other as, as we go. Um, Maybe we can we can learn more from you along the year. This is an event for us to, to see, but it will be always good if uh, a few colleagues share these messages with us and uh, allow us also to pass it to the other context, whether something is happening or not. Allow us to use it in our training modules and materials. Um, allow us also to exchange with you more because this is also preparedness, being ready. You know why we are seen. Maybe in the beginning we are seen like that, and we have to take the initiatives to bring durable solutions on, on board before even others are doing it in camps, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have to do, to do probably some, some more homework about that to, to, uh, to clarify the messages from our side, to go a little bit beyond or the way we are seeing beyond to expand a little bit, to discuss with the donor community, to discuss with the international community, with the authorities that, that we are actually the core of the of the durable solutions because we are the CCM actors. Those are the last resource. Here we understand what exactly is the main problem, you know, to, to find a, a solution. I I don't see a part of this this comment comments that I referred to uh, other uh, questions to you, uh, uh, Valentina and Kate. I I personally find this very very useful. Uh, I think um, uh, Elena has a, a question. Elena, do you want to take the floor to ask the question or uh, it's, it's a long one I prefer than me reading it. Maybe you can just ask the question. No strangers are here. Um, sure. And then we probably give it back to Charlie if this is okay. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with the Iraq response because I've never been based in Iraq. But now that you are fully immersed in the durable solution process and I come closure uh, process and you have your durable solution framework in place, my question is a bit provocative and we always say that we should plan for come closure since the setup phase in a, in a camp life cycle and throughout the camp life cycle we should look at and think about durable solution. My question to you is, did this happen in the, in the Iraq response, uh, considering it was like a crisis that was protected and people as some of the people at the displaced population have been staying in camp for, for a long time. And if it did not happen, do you think that planning for this from the beginning would have made a difference compared to where you are right now in the process? <laughs> Tricky question, Elena. Um, I'm not sure. So the, yes, in some ways, and the, the camps in Iraq were built very quickly. Um, and for the majority of them to the emergency, and actually for the majority of those camps, they, they were emergency camps. We have far more closed camps than we do camps that are still open. Um, I think that there's also very, differences in terms of who can return and who can go where between different ethnic groups and different locations that they are displaced. And so the 
the areas um, the hook, for example, or the political affiliations of families who remain displaced are those that could be predicted five or seven years ago that we're going to find it more difficult to return. Um, so yes, in one way, absolutely. Although I think CCTM actors could have shouted about that until four, five or seven years, but it needs so many more actors to be brought into that and to be brought into that longer term planning. Um, the new sort of coordination architecture that's been set up here in the last two years also has sort of yeah, created durable solutions as this separate discipline. Um, and I think one thing that has shifted in the response is sort of the idea and um, that gets pushed back to us certainly as a cluster to say, ah, this is not humanitarian, this is durable solutions, which Valentina and I were actually talking about before the call saying, well, it, durable solutions should be an outcome. It should be something to which humanitarian actors are contributing for me, particularly CCCM actors and working in camps and informal sites. Um, but instead we start to see sort of more and more in the response to say, no, this is not your remit. This is, this is durable solutions, um, which is a, maybe a strange way of conceptualizing it. So we could have been planning, planning earlier. Um, I think maybe more than the camps and attention is always gonna be on, on the camps. The government attention is always gonna be on the camps of families living in informal sites. Um, and I don't think we're doing a particularly good job as a response in Iraq in being able to recognize particularly vulnerable people of those who are still displaced and really bring together humanitarian and longer term actors, durable solutions actors, to be able to support those communities. And, and certainly on the cluster side, we are concerned about the possibility that humanitarian assistance will stop. And khalas, that is it. The families, families will remain living in the same locations. So maybe less on camps, but also taking that sort of longer term planning and looking at informal sites. Uh, Jim Robinson just mentioned in the camp the, um, the partnership and collaboration between CCCM and HLP, um, which we've highlighted before in some of the CCCM HLP discussions that are going on in Iraq, which has been great. Um, up until the point when HLP um, funding streams really dropped off in Iraq. Um, so yeah, I think are coming together at both the space to discuss, but then also the funding to be able to, to do that as well. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but uh, Dara, back to you. Thank you, Kate. I think, um, I think this is probably, is going to, to remain an open subject for all of us. And we, and we, and we, we will continue discussing. I see that come up from uh, Elena as well. Um, I would, uh, now, for the sake of time, as Charlie says, that the worst thing in life is to, to, to end the session late on Friday. So, Charlie, over to you. <laughs>